All right. Well, uh, Woody, I want to thank you for being with us uh, this morning. And uh, I just got to ask you, how you doing, man? Very well, Seth. Absolutely. Pleasure to be with you. Outstanding. Outstanding. I wish we could do this in person. And, uh, and we will do it in person again soon, hopefully, sooner rather than later. <laughs> well, we'd have to stay six foot apart anyway. We would, but that's okay. <laughs> Well, Wood, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Why don't you uh, why don't you tell all the the, the people watching and uh, tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? That sort of thing. Okay. Well, I was born in a little community called Quiet Dell, Q U I E T Dell, West Virginia, which is near Fairmont, West Virginia, and uh, we uh, my father started a dairy farm, and I was born off the dairy farm but we got to the dairy farm when i was about five years old and uh, i was raised on dairy farm we uh, had a number of milk cows back in those days there were no grocery stores on the corner so people had to depend on farmers to deliver produce to their homes that was the only way they could get it and <clears throat> so we had uh, uh, a route what we called a milk route. And we would load our little Model A first, a Model T Ford, and then the Model A Ford with the produce, milk, butter, cream, vegetables if they wanted them. And we would deliver those to individual houses. The milk in those days came in glass bottles. And you could either get a pint or a quart. And we would, uh, during the summer months when we were out of school, we kids would deliver the milk to the houses. During the winter time, my father and, and those that had already been through school, they had to do it. But we'd stand on the running board, and of course that, that's an old term, nobody has running boards anymore. Uh, we'd stand on the running board of the pickup, and when we'd come to the house that wanted a quart of milk that day or every day, we would grab the milk, run to the house, set it on the porch or on the steps, grab the empty bottle and run back to the pickup and go through our route that day. And we did that every morning, seven days a week because we had to deliver seven days a week. So that's how I grew up. And uh, I stayed on the farm until I was about 16 years old. What happened uh, when you were 16? What, where'd you go? Well, I... <clears throat> A brother, my next brother up, uh, by the way, there were 11 in our family, and I was the last to get here. <laughs> and my, my brother next to me, when he was 16, he uh, was not particularly fond of farming, so he joined what was known in those days as the Civilian Conservation Corps. We called it the three C's. And uh, we had a number of those camps in West Virginia. So he joined one of those and uh, they were paying all the big sum of $21 a month at that time. So uh, he went to a camp in West Virginia and I'm about a year and a half or not quite that younger than he. So uh, when I got to be 16, since he would come home every once in a while and he'd have a little bit of money. I thought, well, I'm going to do that so I can get some money. And of course, my mother was not very happy with this young boy. But I, I went in when I was 16, thinking I would go to the same camp where he was, because I didn't know we had any others. And instead of that, they sent me to a different camp in West Virginia Then eventually they sent me to a little town called Whitehall, Montana. Oh, wow. I'll never get home. This is the end of me. Uh, there's no way I'll ever find my way back to West Virginia. So I spent, uh, that's where I was when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And uh, there were about uh, 265 of us in this camp. Uh, young boys from many states, uh, New York, New Jersey, West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and most of them, of course, the East Coast. But uh, the, uh, the, the CCCs were run by the military. They were run by the army. We had a, a commanding officer 
and we had a first sergeant and a mess sergeant and some and some uh, clerks that did the office work, army boys, and they offered us the opportunity if we wanted to to go straight into the uh, army. And I had two brothers that had already been drafted in uh, 1940. They were drafted in 1941, and uh, they were already sent to Europe. And uh, I didn't particularly, or wasn't particularly fond of the Army uniform. I was more fond of the Marine Corps dress blues uniform. So I, I decided I'm going to go to the one that has the nicest uniform. I didn't know about the Marine Corps, but I like the uniform. <laughs> that's not, you're not the first Marine that's ever told me that either, by the way. I just got to tell you, you know, I've, I've interviewed a lot of guys over my career here at the museum, and, and you are definitely not the Lone Ranger when it came to that. <laughs> well, uh, so you joined the Corps to get a, to get a fancy blue suit. We, uh, we understand that, but... Uh, <laughs> that's, that's right. Did, did you, uh, did you? You could find a girl in a blue suit easier than you could that old brown ugly thing that the army had to wear. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Well, uh, did, uh, when, when exactly did you join the Corps? When, when, when was this? Uh, I tried to go in and, uh, well, just as soon as I got home from the CCCs, I was still only 17 years old. I hadn't reached my 18th birthday yet. And uh, my mother was still trying to run the farm because my dad had died when, we, when I was 11 years old. And so she was still trying to run the farm. And uh, uh, when I asked her if she would sign a paper so I could go in the Marine Corps at 17, she said no, uh, she needed me on the farm and would not sign the paper. Well, then I became 18 in October, so in November, uh, against her better wishes, I went to go into the Marine Corps. I, I didn't know anything about war. I didn't realize I would even be leaving the United States of America. My only thinking was at that time that all of us going into the military, knowing nothing about what was happening overseas because we had no radio, we had no no. Uh, 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 newspaper service, so we didn't know what was going on in the world, okay. and I thought we just stayed in West or in the United States, and uh, I went in primarily to protect my freedom in our country. And that's all I thought I was going to do, uh, never realizing that I would eventually end up in in the South Pacific. Right. Well. Um... Tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your boot training. I mean, Marine Corps, <laughs> Marine Corps boot camp is infamous, especially during World War II. Uh, being a farm boy and having been in the CCCs, like you said, you kind of had some experience with, with uh, a, a rougher type of life, you know, especially in the three Cs. But was, yeah. uh, what was boot camp like for you, though? Well, uh, I, I and five other uh, West Virginians in, our, in my group at that particular time, and we were not the only ones that this happened to, but uh, the only two camps we had, or boot camps we had, was one in San Diego and mm -hmm. Paris Island, South Carolina. So the, uh, the one in South Carolina was getting so many people wanting to be in the Marine Corps from the East Coast that they couldn't handle all the people wanting in. They didn't have uh, trained drill instructors to train them didn't have housing to house them. So they began forming troop trains. So they called it a troop train. And it started somewhere in the South and as it would come up through all the states, uh, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, <clears throat> and West Virginia, it would pick up a few people that were going into the Marine Corps. And there were six of us in my little group <clears throat> that had been designated to go to San Diego, California for boot camp. Mm -hmm. And of course, we as West Virginians, we didn't even know they had a camp out there. In fact, we didn't know they had any camp anywhere, but <clears throat> we went to California, which is very unusual because most East Coast people go to Paris Island. And so we ended up in California boot camp. 
I didn't have any trouble with boot camp. And I think it would be because we were raised in such a way that uh, my, my dad, before, before he died, uh, was very firm in what he would tell you. And he wanted you to know that he would tell you only one time. He didn't want to have to repeat himself. And he would make that very clear to you. So uh, we were used to taking orders and doing whatever we were told to do. And when you got in boot camp, that's what you had to do. The drill instructor was telling you things that you were going to do that you never dreamed that you would be doing. But I didn't question that at all. He was the authority. He was the person that knew what he was doing. And fortunately, in, uh, by the time I got in there in May of 1943, uh, I might add that when I started, when I tried to get in in November of 42, they turned me down because uh, I was too short at that time. I didn't grow any. They just changed the height requirement. So <laughs> then in 43, they began taking uh, individuals that were a little shorter than the normal. And uh, so I, when I got to boot camp in uh, 43, a number of the drill instructors are individuals who had already been in combat and had been brought back to the States so they could train the new people with more realism than you could if you had never been in combat. And that was to our advantage greatly because they, they could train us in a way that somebody who had never been there wouldn't even know what to do. Right, so, so, so I, I benefited, I think, by that. So, so these are guys who are across the canal and places like that. And That's correct. Yes. Well, what uh, what were some of the things that those guys, that those combat veterans, taught you that that were beneficial to you later on? Well, the primary thing that they taught us was we have got to win this war. We have got to win, or we're going to become a different country. And the only way you can win is to eliminate the other guy before he eliminates you. And you must do everything that you can within your power, not only to protect yourself, but to protect the man on your right and the man on your left. You are responsible. You have a responsibility to those two individuals as they do to you. And that was a very basic thing that they taught us. And it, it built a relationship between people that I don't believe would have ever existed otherwise, because it gave us a different concept of what our responsibility was in addition to winning and doing everything we could to win. It gave us the responsibility of looking out for our fellow Marine. And I think that has that resulted in many instances where Marines actually sacrificed their lives for others, not for themselves. They did it to protect that individual on their right or their left. So that that was, I think, extremely beneficial to all of us. Yeah. And there, there's no higher calling than sacrificing yourself for those you love, and that is for That's sure. Right. Yeah. Was, was there anything now? Now you were trained. All Marine are, are trained as riflemen. You know, every, everybody knows that. Was but did you get any specialized training in boot camp, or did you get weapons training after boot camp? After boot camp, yes. Okay. Uh, when we graduated boot camp, the first training that our group received, and it was kind of a new thing at the time, was uh, we began to get a lot of tanks in the Marine Corps. And nobody knew how to function with them. What do you do with it? If the tanks are leading a charge, what do you do as an individual accompanying that tank? So we, we went to a place called Jack's Farm in California for a couple months to teach us how we would work with tanks if we were called upon to do so. And then following that, we went into very basic infantry training of how to fight in combat. And we uh, did that for several months. And of course, the, con the conditioning hikes of 10, 20 miles, full pack, half pack, and all of that, that was to get you in shape so that 
uh, you had the, enough strength and energy and, and knowledge that uh, you could participate for long hours without giving up. You know. So uh, on one of those uh, uh, 10 mile hikes, uh, I got up one morning and, and I had a high temperature. I had no idea what, because we didn't know how to take temperatures back in those days. <clears throat> had to, we thought it had to be done by, uh, by a professional somebody with a, a thing they stick in your mouth. And, uh, but I woke up with a high temperature, feeling terrible, but I felt like I had to make that 10 mile hike. <clears throat> and I made it till noon. Uh, barely, but when we stopped for our lunch at noon, I passed out. And uh, they called the ambulance and took my temperature, and I was running 105, and they slapped me in an ambulance and rushed me to the hospital on the base. And uh, then they put me in uh, ice or put ice around me to get my temperature down. And uh, a couple of days later, I recovered enough that the doctor said, uh, well, we're going to have to take your tonsils out because uh, they're terribly infected. And uh, the, uh, a friend of uh, one of my buddies in my platoon had come to visit me and uh, he had told me, he wasn't supposed to, but he did, that uh, we were shipping out on the day that we were leaving the United States to go to the Pacific. And I had that information, and so I said to the doctor, I, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to leave because I want to go with my outfit. And uh, he said, we, we, we won't release you. And I said, I'm going to go anyway. So he finally said, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let you out and I'll let you go, but I'm going to give you a, a, a slip, and I want you, when you get aboard the ship, take it to the doctor. and." it'll tell him that they need to remove your tonsils. Well, I don't know whatever happened to that slip of paper. I still got my tonsils. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, get, you get aboard ship, I like that by the way, that's a good one. You get aboard ship and uh, where do you go to, are you going to Hawaii? Is that where you pick up the third division or, or where do you go from there? Oh, I, we go from uh, California to a place called New Caledonia. Okay, okay. It was a French-owned island, and it was a, a re, what they called a replacement center. As Marines were being shipped to the South Pacific, they would go to New Caledonia, and from there, they would then be designated to go to whatever outfit they were going to serve with. And uh, so from New Caledonia, my group was designated to go with the 3rd Marine Division, which at the moment was having a fight on Bougainville. And we were to go to Bougainville to help them out because they'd lost so many people and uh, both killed and wounded. And uh, we were to join that battle. So they sent us to Guadalcanal first to outfit us and get us all the equipment that we would need because we didn't have any. and. While we were there, the Marines on Bougainville uh, overpowered the, the enemy and sufficiently that they could say that the island was secure. And the 3rd Marine Division then came to Guadalcanal, and that's where I joined them. I got you. I got you. So you're, you're a, 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 a boot, really, still. I mean, you're a Marine, but you've never seen anything other than, you know, Hawaii and, I'm not Hawaii, uh, California and New Caledonia. That's How did those... Uh, Bougainville veterans treat you when you got into that into that unit? Very well. Uh, yeah. Marines had no difficulty in getting along with each other. There, there was that camaraderie that, uh, well, I'm prejudiced, I'll have to say that, first of all. But I think there is a closeness between Marines because of the type of training that you receive, the emphasis that are put on your responsibility to each other. And uh, so you just fit in. When you just join and you're a part of them, period. Yeah. Yeah. But that's where we first got the flamethrower. We had never heard of a flamethrower. Uh, didn't know such a thing existed. And um, we got to um, Guadalcanal in December of 1943. 
in January 1944, these huge wooden box boxes or crates came to our company. And we had a number of them. I don't remember the number now, but we had a great number of them. And we had no idea what was in them when they arrived. But we broke the crates open, and here's this piece of equipment that none of us had ever seen before. And it was a flamethrower. And a uh, very strange looking piece of equipment. But uh, it had a uh, manual with it that told us all the parts and, and uh, how to make what fuel to use. and that sort of information and uh, how to take it apart and put it together and uh, and uh, how to service it and what to use in it but uh, it didn't have any instructions of how to use it in combat what do you do with it you know? so we had to figure that out by ourselves and as a result of this new weapon uh, the company formed a new unit within the company called a spatial weapons unit. And uh, I was a uh, rifleman, but I'd also been put in a, put, uh, a squad where I had a Browning automatic rifle, a bar, we called it. And I was the barman in the, in the squad. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, they just selected six of us to be in this spatial weapons unit. And I was one of those selected. And so we began figuring out how to use it. And we had tested uh, all kinds of stuff in it to, to uh, see its effectiveness. Uh, it had with it, when it arrived, a powder, uh, a bag of uh, powder and some cellophane, cellophane uh, bag. And it told how to mix that with gasoline how much gasoline to mix with it, and it would turn it into a gel, almost like jello, except that it was sticky, real sticky. And uh, it had phosphorus in it. So we named it a phosphorus gel, whether that was right or not. That was our own term we came up with. But um, we put that in the flamethrower and of course put uh, air on it, uh, compressed air, which would force it out of the flamethrower. And um, it was like shooting a, a water hose because it was just one steady stream. And the flamethrower with that stuff in it or fuel or whatever we used in them, they would weigh about 70 pounds. And uh, it had uh, what we called matches in the gun part of it to set the fuel on flame as it came out of the weapon. And uh, this phosphorus gel, uh, when we would shoot it, you couldn't aim it because you're shooting from the hip. And uh, it didn't last very long. And you couldn't get a whole lot of distance out of it because it was heavy. Mm -hmm. Gel, it had a lot of weight to it. And uh, so it wasn't really, in the opinion of my gunnery sergeant, very effective. So uh, he began experimenting with other kinds of fuel, uh, gasoline and motor oil, and gasoline and kerosene, and gasoline and diesel fuel. And uh, we, he finally came up with a mixture that diesel fuel and 82 octane gasoline was pretty effective but it still didn't have a great uh, amount of heat to it. And where he got the idea, I have, I have no idea, but he decided that if we had some airplane gasoline, which was about 130 octane, mm -hmm. that we could mix with diesel fuel, it would be more effective, you'd have more heat, and you could get more distance out of the flamethrower. So he went someplace, somehow got a 55 gallon drum of airplane gasoline. And so that's what we started using and mixing. And uh, that's eventually what we ended up with. And you could get, if you fired the flamethrower, uh, it would only last 72 seconds. So you had to be very conservative in what you were doing in the way of length of firing it. Uh, 
if you uh, would fire it onto the ground about 15 yards in front of you and roll it like a great big red fireball, you could roll it for another 15 or 20 yards and it would still be burning. And the flame then would just engulf whatever you were shooting at, a pillbox, a person, a cave or whatever. And so that's what we finally ended up with. And, and you were you shoot you were shooting in bursts though, weren't you? You weren't just yeah. holding it down. Two or three second bursts. Yeah. yeah. Like a machine gun, like like an automatic weapon. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise you're just wasting it. You know, I, <laughs> after it does its damage, why follow through with more you know, more flame? It's already done its damage because the minute it hits at burning of uh, uh, somewhere around 3,500 degree Fahrenheit, there's nothing can survive that. Mm. So uh, once it hit, you need, you, you could stop your burst. Right, no doubt. Um, well, Wood, um, I just, before, before we get to Iwo, you, you went to Guam too, did you not, or before Iwo Jima? Yeah, uh, we, uh, we were on Guam, of course, from, uh, I got there, as I said, in December, and the third division came in uh, January. Uh, we were there until June mm -hmm. and on Guadalcanal, and then we shipped out, didn't know where we were going, but once we got aboard ship, they told us that uh, we were going to be reserved to the 2nd Marine Division that was hitting Saipan. So we, we were way out in the ocean, didn't see anything, couldn't hear anything at Saipan, but we were there for several days. I don't remember the number, but quite some time. And uh, they never did need us. They never did call us in. So uh, we sailed then from uh, Saipan or off, off Saipan back to the Marshall Islands, which had already been taken by, by Marines, and uh, refurbished our ship because we'd eaten up everything on the ship, <laughs> and <laughs> refurbished our ship, and still didn't know where we were going to go. When we got back aboard ship, then they told us that we were going to take Guam back from the Japanese. And most of us didn't know that the Japanese had even taken it in 1942. We didn't have that information. And, uh, but we were going to take Guam. And uh, so on uh, July the 14th, we uh, landed at Guam. And uh, of course, the, the Japanese occupied the island and uh, they were well reinforced. Uh, one of the advantages, our advantages, was uh, that they couldn't dig caves to any degree on Guam because of the coral rock. So the flamethrower really was not used to any degree on uh, Guam. I never used one at all. I carried it for several days to start with because we didn't know what kind of territory we were going to include, to involve. And uh, then uh, finally, after five, about five days, four or five days, the commanding officer decided we didn't need the flamethrower because now we're going into the jungle. And it was so thick. Uh, there were places that we were even issued machetes so we could cut our way through the jungle. So flamethrowers just were not effective or would not have been effective. And so I never used one. So the first time you used it uh, as a weapon was was on Iwo Jima, which was right. would have been what? This is July, so six months later. Yeah, that would have been February. Yeah, of '45. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let, let's get to Iwo Woody. Tell me, um, what you guys were reserved for for Iwo Jima too? But I mean, the casualties were so dang bad that you guys had to get ashore. Yes. Sooner than uh, on, the way, on the way to Iwo Jima on the ship. Uh, we got some briefings. They would call us up on top deck and have us sit and, and they would brief us a little bit about what was going on. And they brought out a board of, a four by eight board of some kind that they had drawn the image of 
the shape of Iwo Jima, and they talked about Iwo Jima. Uh, had very little intelligence about Iwo Jima because nobody had ever been on the island, you know. But they did tell us how big it was, that it was about five miles uh, or two miles wide, five miles long. Uh, didn't have any idea, I guess, how many Japanese were on the island. Didn't know that they had miles and miles of tunnels. They didn't have that information. Didn't know how many pillboxes they had on the island. But that we were the reserve to two other Marine divisions, and they were going to hit first. They were going to, they were going to go ashore on the, on the day of the attack. I, I don't even remember that they told us what day that was. It was the 19th of February, but I don't think they told us that. But uh, we were a reserve and we'd probably not get off ship, but we were there in case they needed us, just like at Saipan. And, and uh, that uh, it probably would last three to five days. And then we'd go back to Guam where we left our tent and all of our belongings. So we were away out in the ocean again. We couldn't see anything. Occasionally we'd hear explosion. Uh, I think it was the big uh, guns on the battle wagons that we were hearing. But occasionally from the top deck of the ship, you could hear an explosion. But we still didn't know what, what was happening on the island. There was no broadcast telling us, giving us a rundown of what was taking place. But uh, midnight of the first day, over the loudspeaker of the ship, uh, the word came that we were going to go ashore and that we would have chow at 0300. And uh, I've never fully understood and I've never had anybody that could ad adequately explain to me, why do you eat steak and eggs just before you're going into combat? But that's what we had that morning. We'd never had steak and eggs with the Navy before, but they gave us steak and eggs that morning. And uh, so we got off the ship just before dawn in the Higgins boats. And uh, there were 30, 35 of us in a Higgins boat. Uh, they had had a storm someplace in the Pacific and uh, it wasn't storming where we were, but the waves from that storm were still coming through and they were running about 10 feet waves. So those Higgins boats were just going up and down like a cork, you know. But uh, we got off, well, went down ropes on the ship uh, to get into the Higgins boats. And then they took us out in the middle of the ocean someplace and started rendezvousing, running around in a circle. And there were 12, 15 Higgins boats in a group. And that was the wave. That's what they called first wave, second wave, third wave. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were going around in circles, waiting for the people on the shore to uh, signal that we should come in or could come in. So we did that all day. Never did get the call from the shore to come in because the Marines were pinned to the beach and there was no room for us. There were already so, Marines, so many Marines there that there was no place for us to go. So they took us back aboard ship mm. at night and uh, went through the same rigmarole the next morning. I think we're the only group in the world that the Navy ever served eggs and uh, steak and eggs twice in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think that anyway. <laughs> but uh, then we disembarked again before dawn and went back to the, the rendezvous area. And uh, then a little before noon, the Marines on the beach had been able to break through and head to Mount Suribachi that gave us room so that we would have some place to land when we got there. So we went in actually on the 21st of February. So the battle was two days old when we got there. So uh, your, your actions, for which you were awarded that medal that's hanging around your neck right now, occurred two days later, right? On the 23rd? That is correct, yes. Can, can, you, tell us, uh, can you tell us about, tell us about that? Yes, uh, the airfield, the first airfield, 
that we hit. Uh, of course, there was no, you had to cross the airfield because it, it covered such a space that you had to go across it to advance. And, and going across the airfield, you had no protection. Uh, the only protection you might find would be a shell crater where we had bombed the airfield and there would be a small hole in the ground, maybe six or eight feet in diameter, but not very deep. And uh, you'd run and get in one of those holes. That was the only protection that, that you could find. So as we would jump up and run from hole to hole or try to cross the airfield, uh, we lost a tremendous number of our, of our Marines in our company because uh, they were set up to protect the, the airfield. And these pillboxes were built in such a way that they had open fire all, on all the airport, airfield. And they were also were built in kind of a pod of threes so that if you approach one pillbox, one of the others could also see you so they could get you in a crossfire. So once we got across the airfield, then we began to try to advance to take those pillboxes or at least to eliminate the enemy within them. And as we would jump up and run toward the pillbox, they had an open field of fire and we didn't. All we had was the aperture in the front of the pillbox. And the pillboxes were built out of reinforced concrete. So a bazooka wouldn't even dent them much. And uh, a rifle didn't do anything, of course, to try to penetrate two foot of concrete. So uh, the only uh, target we had was this aperture in the front where they were shooting out of. So they, uh, they got a great number of us as we would several times try to advance and we'd have to back off, try again, back off, lose Marines every time. So on a little before noon of that day, my commanding officer had lost all of his officers except two. Most of our uh, squad leaders were gone. Uh, we were chaotic. Our, our formations were just chaotic. Uh, no more real organization within the group. But uh, I was in headquarters company at that time, and my job as, a, as the corporal was to uh, supply the six Marines that were in the, that special weapons unit uh, with flamethrower or demolitions when they needed them. And when the commanding officer or the platoon leader would say, we need this cave sealed, or we need flamethrower on this pillbox, they would then come and get the material that they needed, whatever it was. And I, it was my job to make sure everything was ready to go when they needed it. But by that day, a little before noon, uh, those six Marines were no longer existent. Uh, I didn't have any. I didn't know whether they had been killed or wounded because it was so chaotic. There was no information being passed around to tell who was getting hit, who was getting killed, none of that ever funneled down to us. And my company commander called for a meeting of all of the non-commissioned officers. As a corporal, I was not one. Uh, I had to be a sergeant or above to be a non-commissioned officer. And uh, so I wasn't going to go. Didn't include me, I didn't think. But my first sergeant, who was still living at that time, told me, you are to go. So I joined the group and we formed in a great big shell crater that probably a, a battle wagon uh, explosive had created so that we could get down below ground level uh, so that they couldn't continue to shoot at us. And uh, we formed in that hole and there, as I recall, looking in my mind, I see around that hole 12, 15 of we Marines and the company commander was talking to us, uh, trying to figure out, I guess, what we're going to do. 
And then he asked me if I thought I could do something with the flamethrower. I was the only one left in my company. And uh, I have no idea what I said. Uh, when we got back to Guam, some of the Marines in the, that had been in that group said that I had replied, I'll try. So uh, he uh, gave me four Marines to give me from protection and told me to pick four Marines. I picked four, picked two out of my own squad that I had been uh, serving with. And I picked two other Marines. I had no idea who they were, where they were from, or who they belonged to. They were just Marines. And I picked those two and uh, set them up where I wanted to put them so that they could shoot at the pillbox to give me some protection as I would try to get to it with a flamethrower. And uh, so I went to work. And that was my job. I wasn't doing anything special. I was doing what I'd been trained to do by other Marines. And had they not trained me, I couldn't have done it. So over a, a period of about four hours, uh, uh, much of which I do not remember, is just as blank as can be, that over a period of about four hours, uh, I was able to eliminate the enemy within seven of those pillboxes. And uh, in the process, uh, those two Marines that I'd selected that I didn't know uh, sacrificed their lives. They were killed that day protecting me. I didn't know that. I had no knowledge of that until after we got back to, to Guam. Still didn't know who they were, what outfit they belonged to, or anything else. And a uh, <clears throat> few, few of those instances uh, during that four hours are so vivid in my mind, I'll never get rid of them. Uh, I'll take them with me when I go. And some I have completely have no memory of. And I've always attributed that a little bit to fear, uh, yet I realized, I think I did then, and I certainly do now, that you can't, you can't maneuver, you can't operate under fear. It won't work. If fear takes over your, your being, you cannot function. But yet I think I didn't want to remember it or fear took it away or whatever, but there's just much of it I don't remember. Tell us, uh, if, if you don't mind, Woody, if, if, if you'd like to, can you tell us about a couple of the things that you do remember from that incident? incident? Well, one of them, of course, is still very vivid in my mind. I, I was approaching the pillbox, I was crawling on my belly, and I was crawling up a ditch. And, this is still very vivid in my mind after all these 75 years. I was crawling up this ditch because I wanted to get close enough that I could fire the flame uh, into the pillbox where they were shooting out of the pillbox with a uh, machine gun. They called it a Nambu. It was a 31 caliber machine gun, really. But they called it a Nambu, and uh, it fired more rounds per minute than our than our 30 caliber did. And uh, they were pretty smart in many, many ways. They made that thing a 31 caliber machine gun, which meant they could use our 30 caliber ammunition. So if they could catch a Marine that had a bandolier on him with 30 caliber machine uh, weapons or uh, bullets, they could take that and they could use that against us. We couldn't use their 31 in our, in our weapon. It wouldn't work, you know. So, uh, but they were shooting at me with this Nambu and it reached a point where the Nambu bullets were ricocheting off of my pillbox, off of my flamethrower. And uh, I, I can remember that, uh, the noise, not only the noise, but the vibration. And But I kept crawling forward, and uh, then I saw a little bit of smoke coming out of the top of this pillbox. It was a large pillbox. I can remember that. And so 
they had piled sand up on top of the pillboxes to protect the pillbox. If you dropped a bomb on it or a piece of artillery on it, it would land in the sand and not hit the structure itself, right. which would take the shock away. And <clears throat> uh, when they did that, the sand, of course, they were throwing it up on the pillbox and, uh, and it was sloped off of the pillbox. So I crawled up the side of the pillbox where that little curl of smoke was, because I figured there was some kind of an opening up there. And I, maybe I could get my flame in the pillbox through that. And sure enough, when I got up there, here's this little pipe sticking up out of the top because they cooked, they ate, they lived in that pillbox. So they used charcoal as their fuel. And of course it had smoke to it. So they put that pipe in there to take the smoke out of the pillbox. And that, that or something was causing that smoke to come out. Probably smoke from the ammunition, but I don't know that. But uh, I put the flame down that little pipe that was in the top of it, and of course eliminated the enemy with him. So that's very, still very vivid. Uh, one other occasion when I was approaching a pillbox, I was almost close enough that I could uh, fire my flamethrower when they came charging out of the pillbox. Uh, <clears throat> they, their back door to the pillbox was on the back side and they came charging out uh, the number. I have no idea. There was just bodies. That's all that's in my mind. I just see several bodies running toward me with rifles and bayonets. And I hit them with a burst of flame. And of course, they were gone. Those are the two most vivid things that stick in my mind that day. It's amazing. Woody, um, during that day and in the, in the succeeding days afterwards, what was, what was Evo like for you after that? What, what was going on? Well, after, after we broke through these uh, seven pillbox areas, that gave us a route that we got through. And once we started funneling through there, we had the advantage instead of them. So once we got behind the pillbox, then they couldn't escape. There was no place for them to go unless they came out the back door. And if they came out the back door or the, or the back opening of the pillbox, right, they were running into Marines. So we had all the advantage after that. But we were still so chaotic in the way of organization that uh, I just selected five other guys, five other Marines. Now, why I did this, I have no memory. Uh, whether somebody told me to do it, whether I did it on my own, I don't know. I do not recall. But there were six of us in this group, formed a squad, and we began advancing forward toward the north end of the island. That was our objective. Uh, our, our mission was to take the island and reach the north end uh, where the ocean hit the north end and then we would have the island secured. So I just took those five other Marines and off we go and if we didn't encounter the enemy then we'd do our best to eliminate him and keep on moving. So we finally ended up at the north end. Mm -hmm. Days afterwards. When, um, and I know everybody's getting, um, by the way, just so you know, you got a lot of fans in the, uh, in the audience here. Everybody's telling you hi and, and everything <laughs> else. So, <laughs> but I'm going to ask you this. So, so this is a blanket question and I already know the answer to it, but I'm just going to ask it to you anyway, for the sake of the audience. Um, what about the flag raising? Did you see it? Did you hear about it? What did you know about the flag raising on your own? Uh, I knew nothing about it until uh, this was just before we crossed the airfield on the 23rd uh, of February. Uh, we're right at the edge of the airfield waiting for whatever orders we're going to get to move. 
and we had tried to dig some holes, fox holes, but we're in that soft sand or ashes, and it was almost impossible to dig a hole because uh, like digging holes in uh, PBs or uh, loose corn. It, you know, you just, you could get some indentation, but you couldn't really form a foxhole. But uh, that's where we were. And all of a sudden, I, these Marines around me began saying something, yelling something about a flag. And some of them got up and began firing their weapons in the air. Just, shoot, just shooting into the air. And that's the first thing that I noticed, but they're all looking back toward, uh, back over my back or back over my shoulder toward uh, Mount Suribachi. Uh I didn't even know anything about Mount Suribachi at that point in time. As far as I'm concerned, it was just a hill. It looked like a West Virginia <laughs> hill. <to me. laughs> but <laughs> it was just a hill. And, uh, but I noticed this and then I looked around and Here's old glory flying on up on top of that hill, and so uh, monkey see monkey do. I began firing my weapon a few times, you know, just celebrating. That's what we were doing. Yeah. But uh, it was one of those things that probably couldn't have happened at a more appropriate time to lift the spirits of the Marines, because when we landed on the beach just a couple of days before that. Everything was blown up, scattered all over the beach. There were packs laying everywhere. There were uh, all kinds of medical stuff strewn all over the, uh, all over the uh, sand. But the thing that sticks more with me than anything else is when I got off the Higgins boat, the first thing I saw were stacks of Marines rolled in ponchos right along the beach edge because we had no place to bury them. And yet we had lost such a tremendous number in the first few days. And that memory has never gone away. Uh, eventually, of course, we did, uh, take a bulldozer or they did, the engineers, and dig a trench and uh, put them in trenches, covered them over in temporary cemetery, uh, stretched a rope, put a dog tag in front of each uh, Marine. And then eventually they built three different cemeteries on the island for each division. So that each division could have their own buried in their own cemetery but uh some of those memories will never go away yeah. can understand um what if 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 you would tell it tell us um when did you hear that you were gonna be awarded the medal of honor well uh yeah. on, or in fact <laughs> iwo jima and following i had never heard of the medal of honor I didn't know such a thing existed. And the only clue that I had that something was happening was I was sitting in my tent one day and this individual, I didn't know him, uh, he stuck his head in the tent opening and said, is there a Williams in here? And my, tent, my bunk was the first one on the right. And I said, yeah, I'm Williams. And he said, well, I'm from Salem, West Virginia. And we had no West Virginians in my outfit at all. None. Uh, as far as I was concerned, as far as I'm concerned, I was the only West Virginian in the whole outfit. So uh, he said, I'm from Salem, West Virginia, and I am uh, in, the, in regiment. In other words, uh, the next unit up, the bigger unit up. And he said, I just typed up something to, uh, get you a medal and uh, i said what what medal and he said i don't know and then he left i never did see him again don't even know who he was so i thought at that point in time it was my purple heart uh 
I had not received, or none of us had received our Purple Hearts from uh, Iwo yet when that happened. And so I figured it, that must be the Purple Heart. I did know about a Purple Heart, but uh, because some of the individuals in our outfit had been, uh, as I said, on uh, Bougainville, so some of them had Purple Hearts. So I knew about those, but uh, nothing else happened. Didn't hear anything from anybody. I do remember some people coming around and talking to other people in our company about uh, what happened on Iwo Jima, but I was told it was to get the history of what had happened. So uh, in September of uh, 45, uh, my first sergeant called me to his tent and uh, told me that I should get in my khaki pants and shirt and tie, had to wear a tie, and uh, uh, that I was gonna go see the general. And where were you at this time? You were on Guam still? Yeah, I was on Guam, yeah. Okay. And I said, what for? And I won't tell you what he said, but he said, I don't know. <laughs> 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 but anyway, he said, that's what I've told the you know, go get your khaki on. Well, when we would, we'd had, we wore khaki every Saturday morning for inspection. So every Saturday morning we had to iron our khaki. We had one iron in the tent and we had built a little table around the flagpole or the tent pole so we could iron our khaki and have a little crease in them and have all the wrinkles out. Then we'd have to stick them back in our sea bag and they'd just wrinkle back up again. <laughs> we didn't have any lockers or anything like that. And so uh, I went and got my khaki out and ironed them up and went back to his tent. And when I got there, there was a Jeep waiting for me. And uh, had a little uh, Marine drive in the Jeep. So I got in the Jeep and I had never been to the general's area. That was off ground as far as we were concerned. And uh, so he drove me to the general's camp which was quite a distance away, several miles away. And when I got there, uh, there was a colonel standing out in front of the tent. And I got out of the Jeep, and saluted the colonel. And, and uh, he said, uh, here's what you do. Gave me my instructions. When you walk into the general's tent, take your cover off. You don't wear cover. And uh, walk up to his desk or uh, he had a desk in there, stand at attention until he tells you what to do. I asked her, so I walked in and she was, he had a red rug on his ground, wasn't his floor, but he had a red rug on his floor. That, that amazed me. I remember that. <laughs> so I walked up to his desk and, and uh, said, you know, Corporal Williams reporting, sir. And he said, stand at ease. So he said, uh, you are going back to the, uh, to the United States, you're going to the White House. If he mentioned the words Medal of Honor, I didn't catch it. I'd never heard of it. So I, if he said it, I wouldn't know what he's talking about. Mm. But I don't even remember him saying anything about the Medal of Honor. The thing that kept running around in my mind, I get to call home. I don't care what he says after that. I'm going back home. And uh, so uh, uh, he congratulated me and she actually shook my hand and then handed me a big envelope and uh, told me I was to report to Washington on October the 3rd. And that you're excused. I walked back out, got in the Jeep and Went back to the tent. That's all I knew. And so they, of course, no, notified the first sergeant that I was to be at the airport. They had a wee little airport uh, on Guam at that time. And uh, it was still dirt, hadn't, didn't have any pavement on it, just a dirt airport. Uh, that uh, I was to report to the airport and I'd catch a, tr uh, a plane and then I would be flying to Hawaii, and then from Hawaii, I'd go to the States. That's all I knew. So I still didn't know what the Medal of Honor was. 
I wasn't even sure why I was going to Washington. Although my order said that's where I would stand up on the third. And uh, to be truthful with you, I didn't even know Marine Corps headquarters was in Washington. I didn't, I didn't know where it was. <laughs> I'm a corporal, corporal don't know anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> but one of the vivid memories that uh, still sticks with me and gives me a tremendous respect for the Americans that were captured as prisoners of war and survived that terrible period in their life. When I got to Hawaii, I was told by the first sergeant there that the prisoners of war were being picked up in Japan and being flown back to the States and that they had first priority on any airplane. So it might be days before I could get out of there. And, uh, and that was true. Uh, I was there about uh, seven days uh, before they could get a seat on an airplane. And finally, uh, an airplane was flying from Hawaii to someplace in Michigan that I learned later. Uh, and uh, we'd been sitting in the waiting room for hours and hours, and it was wee hours of the morning, something around two o'clock. My uh, first sergeant came to get me, and he said, Come on, I've got a seat for you on an airplane. Well, I walked out of the airport. And uh, on Guam, we weren't even allowed to smoke a cigarette out of our tent because of the possibility that, that the Japanese could still see the end of the cigarette blaze. Uh, and uh, everything was, all lights were turned off, kept dark. Uh, we had total blackout uh, when it got dark. But here was this huge airplane and all the bright lights shining on it. Uh, it, it looked huge. If there's a word larger than huge <laughs> to me, it looked tremendous. And that was the plane I was going to get on. And uh, it had steps, I remember going up and I walked up the steps. And when I stepped inside the airplane, here are a group of individuals. Uh, there were supposed to be 50 on the airplane and there were only 49. I didn't know that at that moment, but uh, they were the happiest group of people I think I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. Some of those guys have been there for five years and four years, and three years, and they were so emaciated, their eyeballs, I sockets were sunk in, their, their bones were all showing. Men had weighed 160 and 80 pounds, now weighed 80 and 90 pounds. It was just such a, such a vision. But it was the happiest group of people I believe I've ever seen because they're going home. And uh, finally the plane took off and I got the first seat uh, up front, and uh, I'm sitting by a former prisoner of war that had been there, been in a prisoner for several years. And I was, of course, curious about that because I knew nothing about it. And I was asking him questions about it. And uh, uh, how is we treated? And what kind of work did they do? And, you know, things like that. And uh, he explained to me that they were, that group was working in a coal mine and that uh, you had to get you had to walk into the coal mine and then you had to dig coal all day and walk back out and if on the way back up if you couldn't make it uh, you were gone so uh, <clears throat> it was explaining all that to me and uh, but then he finally made a statement that I've used many times and still remember very vividly you will never really know what freedom is until you have lost it. That is stuck. 
I can imagine. That, uh, I think that's an untold story. Well, I don't want to say untold, but that's not a very well-known story of World War II, especially in the Pacific, is uh, the American prisoner, well, any allied prisoners of war and the way they were uh, mistreated. That's, that's uh, yeah, something that people should learn about, for sure. Well, um, Wood, we're, we're starting to run a little, little short on time, but um, let me ask you something, and I want to, I want to get to your, your cause too here in just a minute. But I just want to ask you one final question: that medal that hangs around your neck, what does that medal represent to you? What does that medal of honor mean to you, personally? Well, once I learned, and it was years later that I did, uh, that. Uh, these two Marines had sacrificed their life, lives, uh, protecting mine. Even though I didn't know who they were, I said at that time and continued to say afterwards, uh, I wear it in their honor, not mine. Uh, they sacrificed more for this medal than, than I did. So, It absolutely changes the life of any individual who receives it. Uh, you take on a personality, uh, a responsibility that you would never have had had you not been awarded the Medal of Honor. And one of the things that makes me feel so grateful is that my commanding officer and four other Marines were willing to put themselves out, do all the work, make all the effort that I, that I would receive the Medal of Honor. I would not be the possessor of this medal had those individuals not been willing to do what they did to make it possible. So I wear it in their honor, not mine. I was just doing that which Marines had trained me to do and I couldn't have not done it any other way. So any time that I wear it, and I certainly do not wear it just to be wearing it. There's got to be a purpose for me to wear it. And when I wear it, I'm always very conscious of the fact that I have it because of what others did for me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now you're, you're getting on to a, a, a different but a similar topic, Woody. Um, you're very passionate about a project that you are currently involved in, and you're spearheading yeah. this project, I know. Um, it's, called, it's for the Gold Star families. Can you tell the people watching this, um, tell us, what is it? Tell, tell us about this. What, what is this project, and, and why does it mean so much to you? Well, just before going into the Marine Corps, <clears throat> I'd already quit my job. Uh, and uh, because I thought when I enlisted, I'd just go. But there were so many people wanting in the Marine Corps, we had a waiting time. We had a waiting list of uh, about three months. So uh, they were only taking back at that time something like uh, two Marines or two people in the Marine Corps from a county mm. in Virginia. So uh, that's why this group I was in was six, we were taken from three different counties. And uh, we, <clears throat> before going in, I had, uh, since I'd quit my job, I needed something to do to earn some money because I didn't have any. And uh, I began driving a taxi cab. Uh, I had a school friend that uh, he and I go to grade school together. And he was a dispatcher for a cab company, and he got me a job driving a taxi from six in the evening to six in the morning. And uh, 
at that time, the country was beginning to receive notices of those being sacrificed in uh, combat. And so the War Department, the only way we had of telling the families at that time was the War Department would send a notice to the Western Union office. Western Union office would put it on a telegram. Then they would call the cab company for a cab driver to deliver that telegram to the family. So I'm, I'm working evenings. I began getting some of those telephone calls. And they'd call me and say, we got a telegram to be delivered to so-and-so. They didn't know what it was when they told me to deliver it. I didn't know what it was when I received it. It was an envelope and uh, it had a War Department address on it. But that didn't mean any particular thing to me until I delivered some of those. And they were the notice to the families that their loved one had been killed. I'm a, actually, I'm only 18 years old and uh, very shy, very bashful. Uh, and in my day, uh, you would never uh, dare uh, try to comfort uh, a lady that you didn't know. You just, that was something you just didn't do. I wouldn't have done it anyway, I guess, because I was so shy. But the minute there had been enough of those men received that the community in which I lived, when they saw the telegram, they already knew what it was. So you had to have a, you're supposed to get a signature that they'd gotten the telegram. And uh, so I'd knock on the door, ring the bell, and they'd come to the door and I'd hand them the telegram with something to sign. And very often they would, they'd break down. They just, they knew what it was right there. And uh, that had a tremendous impact on me. I, it, it was so, so emotional and so sad. So that, that lasted forever. And then I had a friend that he and I went to school together for seven years, walked back and forth every school day for seven straight years. He lived past my house. So he had to walk by my house so we could get to the school. And Leonard Brown, he and I were very close. Uh, actually, I think closer than probably my own brothers. And uh, because we, we hung out together more. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I wanted Leonard to go in the Marine Corps with me, and he said, no, he wanted to go in the Army Air Corps. He liked airplanes. So he went in his direction, I went in mine, or we never corresponded, didn't know where each other was. Uh, I didn't know anything about him, but he was a, became a nose uh, gunner on a B-24 over the Philippines and got hit with some Mac Act and uh, and uh, severely wounded and died four days later and was buried in the Philippines. I didn't know any of that until I got home. When I got home, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, uh, Mr. Brown particularly was kind of a surrogate father to me because my father died, as I said, at 11. So uh, I talked to Mr. Brown more than I talked to my brothers. They, they wouldn't pay attention to me, but Mr. Brown would listen to me. And uh, so, uh, uh, I went to see them shortly after I got home. And hanging in their window were a blue star and a gold star. I didn't know what they were. So I asked what they were, and uh, one of them was for uh, Leonard's brother, Brown, who was still in the Army, and the gold star was for Leonard, who never got to come home. So that left an impact. And of course, Mrs. Brown was still grieving. This was this happened in '44, but she was still grieving in '45. It hadn't gone away, and she couldn't hardly talk about it without crying. And uh, so that left an impact. And then later years, our country began recognizing, to some small degree, Gulf Star mothers, and some organization was formed and. Some communities erected uh, something in tribute or honor of Gosar mothers. And uh, 
working with the Veterans Administration as a veterans counselor after the war and then during the Korean War and during the Vietnam War. Uh, I was dealing with those families that had lost a loved one in, in, in the armed forces, combat or otherwise. So that was something that was almost constant during the war periods. So that certainly left an impact upon my mind. And, uh, but I finally realized that our country, as great as we are, as compassionate as we are as a people, we had never done anything to honor the families of all of those who have sacrificed their lives in the armed forces. Uh, we've done a great job in honoring veterans. We've got veterans memorials for veterans all over this country in every form you can think of. But we do not or did not have anything that honored the families, the extended families. The armed forces only deal with the immediate family. They don't deal with anybody else. So the aunts and the uncles and the grandmas and the grandpas and cousins of those people were never really involved in these losses because it was strictly immediate family. And it finally came to me that we needed to do something in this country to honor those families. In West Virginia, we've got a memorial on our Capitol grounds at has better than 11,000 names on it. Every one of those sacrificed their life in the armed forces in some fashion. And we had never done anything, never said anything, never paid any tribute or nothing for those families. And I decided we needed something to do that. And I was on a committee. We were working on a veteran cemetery at the time, trying to figure out where to put what. And I suggested that we do something like that in the cemetery. And uh, they said, well, we didn't, you know, the committee said, it's a great idea. Uh, come up with something. So I came up with a memorial, took it back, and they approved it. And we did the first Gold Star Families memorial in the Donald C. Kennard Vietnam veteran with seven purple hearts in the whole United States of America. And we thought we were done because we thought we had done for our people what we should have done a long time ago. But other places began to figure out, well, we haven't done anything either. We've never done anything paid any tribute, said anything about all these sacrifices. So it began to grow and other communities throughout the country began to say, well, we need one of those in our community too. So we formed a foundation and to kind of guide the thing along. And uh, West Virginia right now has seven in seven communities. We've got five more in the process someplace in West Virginia. Ohio has 10 and more coming. Texas has a bunch. So they're scattered all over the country from Hawaii to California, Florida to New York and all over. So right now we have 60 communities in this country that have erected a memorial, Gold Star Family Memorial Monument to honor those loved ones and to pay tribute to those families. There's 68 more of them in process somewhere in this country. And we're in 46 states, which says the American people have a big heart. They are a compassionate group of people, which goes back to our beginning, back to our days when that's what everybody was talking about in the early times of forming our country. That's why we have all of these things that says 
God is our supreme being, the father of our country, the, our own father. Uh, and American people have never forgotten that. It's in our blood. So eventually, I know we'll get all of the 50 states that we have. And there will be many, many communities within those states that will erect these memorials to pay tribute to these people who sacrificed more than any of us, regardless of what that sacrifice may have been, theirs was greater. Woody, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you real quick, and we're going to we're going we're to take just two questions uh, before we wrap it up. Uh, what can we do to help? Where can we go uh, to to help your 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 cause here? Your is there a website? Is there someone we should email? What should we do? We have a terrific uh, uh, website, <clears throat> and uh, it's uh, www.mohf.org. Okay. So uh, you go uh, www.hww, that's for Herschel Woody Williams. And uh, then, of course, Medal of Honor uh, Foundation. Okay. So if they go to that, it's a great website that uh, Chad Graham, the president of this uh, foundation, has basically spearheaded and got set up. And he runs the office and does all the dealing with the communities and the committees in those communities. Uh, I, I think he's on here. Uh, he is. <laughs> maybe we can have him to, to say something. Say, say, I'm sorry, say again? Maybe we can have him to say something if he's on here. I, I don't know if we can right now. I, frankly, okay. I, don't, I don't know. But, but if, one more time, re, uh, repeat that website one more time. Uh, www.mohf.org. Dot org. Absolutely, that's a very good. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic cause, Woody, and and uh, you know we support you one hundred percent. And uh, everybody who's watching this and who will watch this later on, y'all need to support uh, this foundation. It's a fantastic thing, and and we stand behind it one hundred percent. Now, Wood, before we before we wrap it up, I need to ask you a couple of questions from the crowd here, and bear with me here. Uh, okay, this one's from Jared. This is a good one. How big is your team when you're using a flamethrower? <clears throat> Normally, we would have one person using the flamethrower, period. In the early beginnings, we had what we called a pole charge man who was to uh, have a pole piece of lumber <laughs> with explosive on the end of it so that uh, and we called him pole charge man because that's what we call it was a pole charge uh that if we burned out a cave or a pillbox he was to follow the flamethrower operator and put the explosive in the cave or the pillbox set it off to make sure that everybody in there was gone mm -hmm. but uh it didn't we didn't always have a pole charge man <laughs> sometimes <laughs> We didn't have one, so I had I had one that started with me on that day, but he got he got hit in the helmet, a bullet hit him straight in the helmet, uh, just before we even got started. So he was out of the <laughs> he was out of the ball game. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't have a full charge man after that. I just I did my own. Gotcha. Uh, one more question, and this this is our, again I already know the answer to this, but I think a lot of people want to hear from you. Um, do you feel the job that you performed was an example of an ordinary person performing in an extraordinary manner? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, yet, I think every end of every flamethrower operator, and we had a, you know, every company had flamethrower operators. Mm -hmm. So every flamethrower operator, I'm sure, would feel the same way that this is my job. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing anything other than my job. If, if I'm a machine gunner, I'm doing my job. If I'm a motorman, I'm doing my job. You know, so, so as far as being, doing something that is beyond what uh, you would normally be expected to do, 
I don't think any of us felt that way. Well, that's uh, exactly what I knew you would say. <laughs> Still, it's good to hear from your own mouth. Well, Woody, uh, I want to thank you very, very, very much for coming on with us this morning. And uh, like I said in the beginning, I wish uh, it was face to face, but hey, this will work for now. And uh, we'll see you again. And I want to thank everybody who's turned tuned in, rather, to uh, well, thank to the, you for giving me this opportunity and listening to me all this time. And thank all the folks who are in, involved in this. And uh, we, we greatly appreciate it because we must not forget our history. There is a saying: if we forget our history, we have a tendency to repeat it. That is exactly right. Let's never, ever forget. No, no. And uh, you can rest assured that the National World War II Museum will not let people forget either. I can assure you of that as long as I'm around. Um, and uh, one more time, everybody, go check out Woody's website and um, donate if you can and do the best you can to get this uh, project to Woody's. Keep, it, keep, the, keep the train moving. Keep the train moving down the tracks. And uh, Woody, it is always a pleasure and it is always an honor. Thank well, you very much. Fun. If somebody in a community that wants information about the organization, contact Chad and he'll send them a bundle. That, that he will. I guarantee you. <laughs> well, thanks, Woody. I appreciate it. Simplify, stay safe, be healthy, my man. Thank you. Simplify. Thank you. Bye.